Shortly after returning from Paris Fashion Week in March, Sophia Neofitu Apostolo, the editor-in-chief of Ten magazine, came down with COVID-19. And Sophia kindly agreed to join us here at the Voices Studio in London to talk to our editor-at-large, Tim Blanks, about the incredible personal journey she's been on this year. So please join me in welcoming Sophia and Tim, who I have to say, it's a real pleasure to see for the first time in person since those days back in March in Paris. Um, so over to you now, Sophia and Tim. Thank you, Imran. Uh, it's true, remembering back to those days in Milan, just before we headed out to Paris, there was a tinge of panic. But um, there was even talk about whether the shows in Paris would go ahead. They did. The show must go on, of course. But this is where Sophia's journey begins. And I came back from Paris on March the 3rd. Now, there was a big party in Paris that night. And if um, you want to point your finger at a super spreading event, I mean, maybe you could point there. But Sophia, I wonder if you had any sense of the moment where you might have crossed paths with COVID-19. Honestly, can't pinpoint a certain specific moment. I think what you do retrospectively is think about the amount of bodies pressed against one another going into the show, coming out of the show. We literally have, you know, a 12-inch space to sit in next to each other, maybe even less sometimes. We're given such a tiny space. And the idea that we didn't really take it seriously, I think Imran said at the beginning, when Armani announced that he was going to cancel his show, we were like flabbergasted, like, how can he do that? What does it mean? Is this real? We just didn't uh, absorb the danger. And that's not to say we were foolish, but we just didn't have enough information. And I think we were just foolhardy in how we discussed you know, approached what we were doing. So we got on the planes, we sat and had dinners together. We actually had a party in in Paris celebrating 20 years of the magazine. All of us there sweating in a room like an old school party. You know, it it didn't occur to us. So no, we had no, I just had no idea that it would escalate. And. Honestly, I was one of the ones that was, oh, this isn't that bad. A friend of mine <laughs> told me that I sent her a text um, when I first get, started getting my fluey symptoms. And I said to her, oh, I've got these fluey symptoms, but I'll be fine in five days. She didn't hear from me again till June. I sent that message to her in March, March the 12th. Mm. So that's the scale of how ridiculous I feel now about what happened then, you know, just didn't take it seriously. But, you know, at, the, at that time, the, the, by the time we came back from Paris, it was, it was yeah. the change, the, the global change was already underway. It seemed like it struck the, the British fashion industry, the attendees at the shows particularly strongly. I mean, when I, 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 talk, I still talk to people who say, well, I don't know anybody who's, who's had this thing. And that's why there's this, you know, you still meet skeptics. And I could think of 10 people who'd been at the shows, who'd been at the shows that, that I'd been with them. Why do you think it hit you so hard? Personally, for me, I mean, I know a lot of my friends in the industry did get the virus, but we all got it at different stages. And... I mean, what they told me was that my viral load was so high that I was energy-wise very depleted. We'd, I'd gone straight from Milan to Paris, back home for a big, my godmother's 80th birthday. So I've been traveling back and forth, not very much sleep because our lives, as you know, in that show season isn't just the shows, it's the dinners, the breakfasts, the constant interaction with people. And also we are quite physical when we see one another, even if we see each other every day, we kiss hello, we kiss goodbye. There isn't that distancing that maybe a lot of other industries actually have. We, we do have a very social interaction at the shows. And so I feel like we all became super spreaders. We just did. I mean, I just, my approach to things now is so very different. 
I, I'm much more conscious of how close I get to people. Are they wearing masks? Have they been tested? Even to come here today for me was a big, as I've said to you, I haven't been in a room with this many people since March. And there aren't many. Either. And there aren't many people in this room. And the, the reason I'm here is because Imran was so specific about how COVID safe it was. And that's my big priority now. How COVID safe is everyone? Have you been tested? When were you tested? Because it's not a joke. It's not. How? But how did it matter? You, you say <clears throat> you were having flu-y uh, flu symptoms. It manifested itself as that. But a few days after you left Paris. Yeah, I like mean, you two, had a pretty two long weeks, duration. Two yeah. weeks, two weeks. It was two weeks. But what happens is, you know, when we get back from the shows, we're so tired. We call it fashion flu. We get this flu where we do want a duvet day, where we do want to just try and recharge our batteries because we are so tired and we've worked really hard for a month. You know, if you go to New York and you've traveled and I do menswear and couture, so you're constantly on this treadmill of travel and airports and airplanes. Now I think of all these places as huge germ-filled. Petri dishes. <laughs> yeah, Petri dishes, I do. That's what I think of them as, because every time you touch your phone, you've touched another surface, it's gone through an airport. You know, that whole idea of, I can't fly till next May because of my lungs are so damaged from the illness, but even the idea of going to an airport fills me with fear, just because of all the, you know, the possible virus places the virus can get you in a way. But, but when you first started feeling ill, yeah. how long after that was the progression to...? Being put into hospital. Yes, yeah. So I started feeling ill about a week and a half after I got back, and I just thought it was fashion flu. So I started taking my day nurse, night nurse combo that I tend to take, and then it just wouldn't get better. And I think... Yeah, it was, it was on the 18th of March that my husband was like, right, we're going to call an ambulance. You're not breathing properly. And, you know, I was in the ambulance outside the house for half, 40 minutes, actually, it was. And they were like, we've got to take you into hospital. So, yeah, it was a week and a half after I got back. And then you were ventilated. And then I was ventilated, because I think at the time, that's the only solution they had for the illness. Um, Retrospectively, do I believe that was the best solution? Not really, because the damage that all causes is just so huge. You, you're lying still for a month. You're, more people die on a ventilator than survive. You know, the odds are 70, 30. So I think now less people are, putting, are being put on ventilators, more are given a combination of oxygen, antibiotics, steroids but I think at the time it was the only solution available so there's no blame to be you know given to anyone it was just how can we make them breathe the only way we can get oxygen inside them quickly is by ventilating it's interesting when we were talking about your experience and and I and you you said you woke up after a month in yeah. an induced coma and the world had changed. Yeah. People's vocabularies yeah. had changed. Yeah. And I said, it sounds like the walking dead. Yes, yes. And for me, when I woke, I was convinced it was the next day. I totally convinced. So I was, oh, is it Saturday? Because I'd gone in on a Friday. They were like, no, it's April the 18th. I was like, what? And they haven't got time because they're really dealing with lots of people that are really barely surviving all around you, like in different wards, in different rooms, you know. And the nurses were, well, we had to put you in an induced coma. And I was, I don't understand. They were like, you've been in a coma, a coma for a month. And then, and then I was, well, where's my family? And they, they were saying, well, we're in lockdown. And don't forget, I'd gone into my, this month of sleep before lockdown happened, lockdown happened on the 23rd, I think, and I was in my coma from the 18th. So I just didn't understand what that meant. I, I, what does lockdown mean? They were like, well, all the pubs are closed. These were the, I mean, it was, and I was like, yeah, but where's my family? They were like, no, you don't understand. Nobody is allowed to visit. Nobody, 
People have to queue to buy food. People are bulk buying toilet paper. And my mind was just racing. How is this possible? And it was the land of the living dead. It just felt like that, like apocalyptic. You know, I, I think something that comes through very, very strongly about your story is your family. Yeah. And yeah. This, is, this is the most tragic element of, of the pandemic, one of the most tragic elements, has been the isolation of people who are ill. But in your case, because you had, you were seriously ill, and then you had an extremely long recovery in which your family was totally instrumental. I mean, without my family, I honestly don't believe I could have come through at all. It was so hard when I woke up because I couldn't move and I didn't understand why. There were lots of questions and I was very insistent about FaceTiming someone, anyone, so they had to try and get me to communicate that way. But without them, I just don't know how I would have done my, you know, my mother-in-law used to cook me my favourite soup, my sister, every day, different meals, every, you know, every opportunity, my brother, my mom, my husband, everybody gave so much love, and but none friends... None of them ever got... None of them ever... Well, ever we don't know. We don't know because I don't think we all understood. I think my son did have it when... Because he was in Milan with me, but we sent him home early, so... Maybe he did have it. My husband had flu symptoms, but we weren't sure. But apart from that, no. And I don't know if, you know, when I was taken into hospital, they said that my lung capacity was only at 20%. So they had no option but to ventilate. But, you know, I mean, I think since they've realised it was an inflammatory disease and if, if there had been the option of giving anti-inflammatories it would have helped with all the all the symptoms that i then had like the lack of breathing i mean the the reality now is i'm tachycardic i you know you do suffer quite badly with fatigue the fatigue is something i've never had that you know i've always been an incredibly energy i mean you know incredibly energetic person and now i have to be very like store my energy, use it when I need to make sure I daytime nap even. I've never done that, you know, daytime nap, you know, but, you know, and, and mentally it takes you on a journey that I can't even begin to understand or, you know, so when people say, oh, you're back to normal, outwardly maybe, outwardly. You mentioned something extraordinary. You mentioned survivor's guilt. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pretty... After the after the the experience you've had, that's 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 like a. I know it's a reaction. I know it's a it's, yeah. it's, it's a it's a common reaction. But still, why? I don't know. I think look a, a lot of the things that happened to you. I mean, when I was I woke from the coma and I was in, you know, ICU. That the, the nurses were like, this is something that happens to people that have survived a terminal illness. It's something that you have to deal with mentally through help with, you know, seeing the right people. I think that's what needs to happen. The information needs to be liberated for all of us because it's not just a physical assault on your body, it's a mental assault as well. And you do, you know, I looked at these amazing people in, in my hospital, the nurses, the doctors, all the people risking their lives every day and the reality of them asking, oh, what do you do for a living? And I, I felt guilty. I did feel terrible, you know. I'm in fashion. I felt so, was I doing enough? Should I do more? How will I change my approach to what I do? You know, and that did, it was a big wake up call. It really was. And now you're evangelical. <laughs> I mean, I sort of, thing. yeah, I am. In a way for me, I feel like we have to, all of us contribute to things to change them. I mean, my, my healing processes have been multi-layered. You know, I have seen psychologists and physiotherapists, but also 
Western medicine cannot offer me everything I need. And so I have seen a herbalist. I mean, I'm married to an acupuncturist, so I have acupuncture weekly. So those things in the end are the things that really have helped me. But mentally, I force myself to do things that, you know, are just approach life in a very different way. Every moment's become precious. And that sounds so cliched, but it does because our lives are so, the speed at which we live our lives in this industry is so fast that sometimes we blink and we miss it. We just do, that's the truth. I have become a much more, much more obsessed with nature, with taking time, spending time with people I care about you know, COVID allowing, but you know, that's definitely what it's taught me. I think um, you're going to have a lot to teach everyone that you've worked with all these years, but thank you very much. You're and so it's welcome. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> you're and so welcome. I'm so grateful that no. we can do this. Well, hopefully <laughs> we can do more. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah.